Hi, I'm Rigger. This is You Alright, and let's talk about the God of Animals. Kinda random, I know. Perhaps not the most pressing issue facing our team. But after we learned what we learned about the brothers, I couldn't help but revisit this odd little nugget of a story. On one hand, sure, it's just a tale of how the Faunus came to be. It's just one of their legends and nothing more. But on the other hand, you can't deny how the fairy tales play into this story, how important they are, and that it could in fact be more than that. So I thought it was worth at least revisiting. So, here's the deal. One of the biggest points against this whole legend and fairy tale being quote-unquote real is that there's two versions even within the same story. There's one where the god invites the people to jump into the shallow sea, whereupon they are turned into the Faunus, and one where he halted a conflict between man and animal and combined them. Now, possibly both happened, or neither happened, but what I wanted to do was just explore the possibility that either way that he's entirely real. Because coming off that legend, a lot of people assumed one of two things. One is that he is entirely fictional, some kind of corruption of the tale of the brothers and that's why he sort of looks like them. Or the other one, that's perhaps even more common, is that it is one of the brothers in disguise. More likely the God of Light, obviously. Now, that second one makes a lot more sense than it just being completely made up given how close it is to the brothers. Usually I'd say not, because we somewhat have to take the gods on their words just because we don't have any other choice. And they said they were leaving. However, given that Ozma was reincarnated after the birth of the Faunus, if we assume that the gods leaving means they're no longer interfering, then reincarnating Oz would actually be their last step, meaning that whatever happened to the Faunus and the birth of them happened before that, meaning it would still fall within the time that they were here doing things before they left. And if that's the case, it would make sense. Now, I know also there has been a long persisting idea, a long persisting theory, that somehow Salem made the Faunus. And I just can't get on board with that at this point, at all. How could she possibly have done that? I know why to sow dissension among humanity, I understand that motivation, but I just don't think she's capable of such a thing, let alone be prepared for the rebirth of man and have that all set up to craft such an outcome. I just can't see that she is capable of that. I can absolutely see it as an added test from the brothers, though. Especially when you consider the rules laid out to Ozma, the part about not fighting amongst yourselves, to put that little wrinkle in there would make a lot more sense. It would make it harder for humanity to come together, be a challenge, and, you know, that fits a godly sort of trial for the very creators to craft that little wrinkle into humanity's future. So for the rest of this, we're just going to put aside the idea of just discounting it as a myth. Let's just put that aside because it's not useful. Because we've seen these fairy tales are pretty important and for the most part a version of the truth. So let's reinvestigate the god of animals particularly. The leading likely theory is that it's the God of Light in disguise, which, like we just discussed, is because he's adding an extra challenge to humanity's redemption. And it all matches, it makes sense. The God of Animals has basically his powers with the white flashing, it has his color scheme, it has the no mouth thing, it has his appearance to a point, and it being the God of Light is a really good candidate. There is a point against it, of course, which is why does he look like this and not just like himself? It's not like he has to hide from anyone. The only people who'd be alive right now who even knew what he looked like was Salem and like she could do anything about it. And the mere fact that the god in this form is actually a lot closer to what the Faunus actually look like. But of course, I understand that there's easily a counter to that, which is this is a story passed down through legend. If you were to describe the god of light in his normal form and then give it however many years, it would end up looking like this, you know, a being that was almost a man, but with animal horns and appeared bathed in golden light with a mouth that you couldn't see and white flashes happened whenever he used magic. All these things are a description of the God of Light as well. And then this is just the figure they've picked out. That makes total sense and could possibly be. However, with the conclusion of Volume 9, I just wanted to explore that with our new information, two more possibilities of the origin of this being have opened up and I just wanted to talk about them. The first is the most obvious of the two, perhaps, that he's another godlike being born of the tree. Two were born, there could be more. Sure, we have basically the incarnation of creation and destruction in the brothers, and God of Animals is a bit of a step down from that title. But nonetheless, we know the brothers were the first two born from the tree, putting at the top of the pecking order, you know, the first beings born from the great power that are godlike in their abilities large and in charge for the power levels, but that doesn't discount there being other lesser gods following after. That there might be other early born creatures from the tree with a subset of abilities, but still quite powerful compared to everything else. We still put the brothers at the peak, second only to the tree itself, but under them we could have a god of seasons, a god of elements, etc. Other things in creation, other things in existence. 
gods of lesser ability, but still dwarfing pretty much all other life outside of their older siblings. It is true that such beings weren't covered in the tale we were told, but then again that tale was also only told about the brothers and what they specifically did. There would be no real reason to mention just other beings born of the tree, or you'd start mentioning every being born of the tree, which, at least in the Ever After, is every being. Or almost every being, and we'll get back to that. But the point is, at least to Team Ruby, there would be no real reason to mention other god-ish beings born after the brothers, they're only asking about the brothers. Also, if that were the case, it would make sense why you would be able to leave, being on similar stead to the brothers. The brothers were granted a passage out, and perhaps if it wished to follow its big brothers, that it too wasn't bound to the Ever After, unlike, say, the cat is. Which also could have to do with the fact that the cat was made by the brothers and not made by the tree itself. Whereas, if the god of animals was born from the tree, it might have similar abilities to them and be able to leave like they did. And, if it did choose to leave and follow its older siblings, it might have arrived on Remnant, perhaps even after they left, and saw what was happening. Perhaps even attempted to show its worth to its older siblings. Perhaps he can solve this issue that the brothers left behind, and united man and beast in an attempt to do so. However, this was unsuccessful, with people rejecting the transformation and segregating those who were transformed, and the god realized that he in fact did not have the answers to this question, and left, possibly continuing on the trail of attempting to find his older brothers, and ultimately be with them one day. The next option though, our second option, is perhaps even more likely to me now. Because after finding out about the cat, we know something else. The gods have, more than once, attempted to make very powerful beings lesser than themselves to do their work. In fact, a being basically made in their own image is very on brand for them because the god of darkness already did that with the Jabberwalker. The god of animals, if anything, would be the god of light's answer to the Jabberwalker, made basically in his image and an incarnation of some form of his powers. And possibly that being might not have even been made in the Ever After. The cat was made in the Ever After. But that doesn't mean that's where all these beings are made, because the gods can make them, just like they made the cat. But taking inspiration from his brother's idea for the Jabberwalker, it's actually kind of really likely then that the god of animals was real. That rather than the god of animals' image being a corruption and, you know, passing down of the idea of the god of light's form, it just is very close to the God of Light's form, just like the Jabberwalker is quite close to the God of Darkness's form, but not quite the same. And that's where the idea of a lesser god sort of comes to fruition, especially because when we hear tales of the gods, it was always that man was their masterpiece. But he, specifically the God of Light, specialised in creating life, at least more than his brother did. Perhaps the God of Animals then is like the cat. A powerful creature to either be a guardian of the animals or look over the animals, perhaps even including humans, or perhaps not including humans and even coming before them. And that's where I'd like to put forward an idea. We know the cat was made in the Ever After. We know the gods left and made Remnant. But we don't know what else they created besides Remnant. They were left to go and create, not specifically create Remnant, create whatever. We believe that tale, that man was meant to be their masterpiece, and perhaps it was. But they made other life and other things beforehand. How do we know Remnant was their first creation? Because I see people saying that, that the gods were fresh out of the Ever After and then made Remnant. We have no idea if that's true. There could have been a thousand, ten thousand worlds and planets ideas before Remnant. We have no idea. So in fact, the god of animals could even be from another of their creations. A past version. A godlike being of the god of light made to watch over life on one of his creations that he then decided to leave whilst he was trying to figure out the kinks of making animals and life before arriving on Remnant, before working on their masterpiece, which included animals and the rest of things. Now, there's no evidence to that, but there's also no evidence that it's not that, a godlike being made by the god of light to watch over life on one of his creations that decided to leave and try finding them, eventually arriving on Remnant and having missed them. Again, perhaps it tries to help with its powers, or simply just wants to use its powers, on this failed man experiment, and it doesn't work, and it gives up and keeps moving on. Again, it's very in line with how the brothers act to make powerful beings and leave them behind, even if it was made for Remnant, not from some other world or something. This all still fits. Especially when you consider the behaviour of the gods before, of making the cat to do their duties, and making Jabberwalker to cover their duties, to do the things they didn't feel like doing because they were too busy making stuff. If the god of light created all these animals and life, but then they moved on to make humans, 
why wouldn't he make, like, a powerful secondary being, not as powerful as him, but quite powerful, to have dominion over the animals while he and his brother worked on humans, even if it was all on Remnant. That's very, very like them. Also, the fact that it looks like a man means nothing about being made in the Ever After or not, because even inside the Ever After, the gods had already taken that shape. So, we can't tell when they would have crafted an image of themselves. It could have been from any time in their history, too. So, there's no way to put a time scale on when or where this being could have been made if it's real. Again, having similar powers and color scheme to its creator makes perfect sense. They already did that once. Again, the only difference between it and the Jabberwalker is it's perhaps a little higher up the totem pole in terms of power, but also its powers are very different given what it seems to have at its disposal, and its purpose is very different. Also, while I'm here, I'd like to point out something very weird that you can notice about this tale, especially with what we have now. So, it's called the Shallow Sea, and we of course think they're talking about the Shallow Sea on Remnant, right? Because people, Remnant, all that. But did you notice the other parallels in this tale? That when it starts out, the people are ferried up to a mysterious island with magical water where they jump in and change. It's almost like we just went to a place like that. And did you also notice that then in the tale after, it's humans going to war with talking animals? It's almost like we were just in a place where that exact thing could happen. What I'm saying is, I can't prove anything, but there is no way not to prove that this isn't also a tale of people being taken to the Ever After, coming into contact with Afterins, and leaving changed. We also just had a whole thing about people possibly changing and coming back different. And also, just because they mention beings like Alex coming into the Ever After and leaving, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened with other beings that aren't being named. Perhaps even the first Faunus were taken to the Ever After, changed, and taken back. They're more than willing and able to enter and leave. And so are the brothers. So even if this was the brothers, it could have been them taking beings to the Ever After, meeting the talking animals, coming up with changes for them, and sending them back. Because it should also be noted that the blacksmith said that if the gods ever wished to return, they were welcome to, but it didn't say they'd be trapped here if they did. They seemingly could come and go as they please, so there's nothing to say that they haven't done that. Or the god of animals did that, or something else, but I can't ignore these parallels being here, of the mysterious magical island, the talking animal conflict, the fading off into white as they go through to somewhere new. Those things are just too hard to ignore. Again, I'm not saying it definitely happened, but I'm not saying it definitely didn't either. And while yes, in that tale it ends with the new Faunus fighting Grimm, that obviously wouldn't be in the Ever After, we can also substitute all these things. Remember, this is a tale passed down, so all of the elements could be correct without it actually happening this way. Like, the God of Animals could be the God of Light, and they could have gone to a mysterious island that was the Ever After, and they were changed into the Faunus, and then they were sent back and forth to Grimm, but in the tale, it just sort of all rolls into one because that's a better story. That interpretation doesn't necessarily have my full support, but I thought I'd point it out, because when am I ever going to talk about this? But it is right there. My suspicions were raised from the very first shot, actually, when the camera goes from the water up to the sand. It's very similar to the shot we ended on for Volume 8, but I couldn't prove anything then. I still can't prove anything now, but... There's certainly a lot more evidence than there used to be. And also, with this whole discussion, I understand that ultimately it may not matter. However, I just found this concept incredibly interesting. That there could in fact be a multiverse of Ruby out there, and a multiverse of gods to go with them. Perhaps not the highest power gods, that's still the brothers and above them the tree, but all these subsidiary gods. Not only could the tree possibly have made ultra-powerful beings as well as the gods that we don't know about, but also the brothers themselves have shown they're more than up to and capable of making powerful underlings that even look like them and leave them to govern lands and do things they just don't want to do. What also is interesting is the line about the door being open to all of the brothers' creations to go in and out of the Ever After. And the blacksmith comments how great those creations are, every time they've interacted they've changed things, just like when Alex came through, etc. And in that, they're talking about humans, but we know the gods made a lot more than that. Other beings could have passed in and out too, especially if they were made on the outside, passed in and then went back out again. They'd be in the same boat as humans. 
So that also could have happened. My point being, there could be an endless amount of worlds and beings that the gods have made and played with and left behind that all could have their own powers, abilities, and we don't know how they might travel. They might have their own magic items that the gods just left laying around in other places. We have no idea. They could have their very own magic systems, completely different than what we had on Remnant, or the magic that people had. Just different versions of things given to different places and different beings at different times and perhaps in different realities. The possibilities are actually endless now. They could have done more than Remnant, a lot more, with a wide variety of also power levels. There could be a pantheon of powerful creations, be they good, bad, or indifferent, at near godlike levels, although perhaps just under the gods so they still have ultimate control of everything they've made. And we have no way of knowing anything about them, their means of travel, their motives, what they want. So while it probably won't play into the story and it probably won't matter in vacuo, the concept is intriguing. And now with all this new information, what it means is we can't just discount anything. So we used to be able to say that the god of animals is very close to the god of light and is probably just a version of him because he's so similar. He looks similar and he has similar powers. And, you know, that's close enough because it's probably just like the gods or whatever. Now we can't write it off like that. Now it's not so easy. Now we can't just sort of disregard it. We have an origin story for the gods, which means there could be more. And we've seen what the gods can make, which means there could be more. And we don't know how much they've made, which means there could be endless amounts of all these things. So we can no longer move past these concepts. We have to consider the ever after, the tree. The brother's past behaviours, the brother's future behaviour, what could have happened in regards to beings like this, they all have very plausible explanations for all of it now. And I just thought that was really cool. So I thought I'd bring the God of Animals back up once again out of obscurity because no one's talking about him, but perhaps we should. And look, it's true, at the end of the day, even if he is real, I don't think we can get in touch with the dude, and I don't think he can help, or even that he would help if he could. We don't know his motives or what he's going to do. I'd have no idea how we'd get in contact, how we'd start about it, or how the team would even learn about such a thing, except for maybe Blake saying, here's another fairy tale, I wonder if this one's true too. But it does mean that now we have to consider the fact that if he does say that, she might be right. So, just in case, before this tale is forgotten and we all move on, I thought it'd be fun to just bring it up one more time. Anyway, until next time, my name is Rigger, hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope I did alright.